The knee, acute or traumatic injuries. The kinetic chain is directly affected by motions and forces occurring at the foot, ankle, lower leg, thigh, hip, pelvis, and even the spine. With the kinetic chain, forces must be absorbed and distributed. If the body is unable to manage forces, breakdowns occur to the system. The knee is very susceptible to injury resulting from absorption of forces. The general assessment of the knee. Just like the foot, ankle, and lower leg, the knee should follow the same hops format for initial evaluation. History is general to what we have already reviewed. Observation should include a thorough postural examination. It is important to observe the alignment of the femur on the tibia. Normally, the angle between the femur and the tibia ranges from 180 degrees to 195 degrees. An angle of less than 180 degrees is called genuvalgum, also known as knock-kneed. An angle greater than 195 degrees is genuvarum, also known as bow-legged. Hyperextension or posterior bowing of the knee is called genurecurvatum. In the knee, we also have the patella. The patella is a bone that's suspended in the patellar ligament. Some patella abnormalities that we might encounter include patella alta, which is a high riding patella caused by a long patella tendon. Patella baja, which is a low riding patella caused by a shortened patella tendon. Squinting patella, which is medial riding patellas caused by hip antiversion or internal rotation of the femur or internal tibial rotation. And the last one is frog eyed patella. This is a lateral riding patella caused by hip retroversion or external rotation of the femur or external rotation of the tibia. Prevention. Strengthening and stretching exercises should focus on the quadriceps, hamstrings, gastrocnemius, IT band, and the adductor muscle groups. Rule changes in contact sports, particularly football, have significantly reduced the number of injuries. Modifications of acceptable techniques that prohibit blocking at or below the knee and blocking from behind have reduced many traumatic injuries. Research has shown that shoes with longer or regular cleats placed at the peripheral margin of the sole, with a number of smaller pointed cleats in the middle, produce higher torsional resistance and are associated with a significantly higher ACL injury rate when compared with shoe models with flat cleats or screw-in cleats or with pivot disc models. Additional prevention. The most ideal outcome for patients is prevention of injuries before they happen or prevention of recurrence. To prevent knee injuries, patients should incorporate physical conditioning and rehabilitation. Total body conditioning is recommended and should be required. Strength, flexibility, cardiovascular endurance, muscular endurance, agility, speed, and balance should all be addressed. The muscles around the joint must be conditioned with flexibility and strength to maximize stability. If possible, we would like to avoid abnormal muscle action through the use of flexibility. In an effort to prevent injury, extensibility of the hamstrings, erector spinae, groin muscles, quadriceps, and gastrocnemius are all important. To decrease the risk of ACL injury, focus on strength, neuromuscular control, and balance. There are a series of different programs that address balance board training, landing strategies, plyometric training, and single leg performance. These can all be implemented in a rehabilitation or a preventative training program. Some injuries that may be acute or traumatic include the knee plica. A knee plica is a soft connective tissue structure within the knee. This can become irritated, causing knee pain and episodes of pseudo-locking in the knee, where a patient may be sitting for a period of time and cannot straighten their leg when standing. Patients may state snapping or locking. Pain with stairs and squatting is also likely. There is usually little to no swelling and no ligamentous laxity. 
patients can treat their plica with rice and NSAIDs, or sometimes surgical intervention is required if episodes are recurrent. Medial collateral ligament sprain, also known as an MCL sprain. The medial collateral ligament is the largest ligament on the inside of the knee that links the thigh bone, the femur, and the shin bone, the tibia. Damage to a ligament is referred to as a sprain, and depending upon the severity of the injury, it is classified as a first, second, or third degree sprain, as similar to other sprains. The injury is usually caused in one of two classic ways. In collision sports such as soccer, rugby, and American football, the medial collateral ligament can be damaged when an opponent applies a force, usually from their knee, to the outside aspect of another player's leg, just above the knee. Alternatively, the medial ligament can be damaged if the studs of the cleats get caught in the turf and an individual turns to the side, away from the planted leg. Common signs and symptoms include medial knee pain, joint effusion, and limitations in range of motion. Management should include immobilizing the knee, referral to a physician's office, ideally to an orthopedic specialist, for evaluation. Most frequently, MCL injuries are not surgically repaired due to poor healing rates and poor clinical outcomes. Lateral collateral ligament sprain. The main cause of lateral collateral ligament sprains is direct force trauma to the inside of the knee. This puts a varus force pressure on the outside of the knee where the LCL is located and causes it to stretch or tear. It is common to have tibial external rotation at the time of injury as well, which increases the joint space. Common signs and symptoms of lateral collateral ligament sprains include lateral knee pain, localized swelling if the injury is isolated to the LCL, limited range of motion, and a possible avulsion fracture at the fibular head. Management for lateral collateral ligament sprains include immobilization, and referral to an orthopedic specialist for evaluation. It is common for lateral collateral ligament sprains to be repaired surgically, unlike the MCL. Anterior cruciate ligament. The anterior cruciate ligament injuries can have two different mechanisms of injury, either a contact or a non-contact mechanism. Non-contact ACL injuries occur as a result of a plant and a twist, such as getting a cleated foot stuck in turf or grass when changing directions. There is a valgus force typically placed on the knee. The femur internally rotates and the tibia externally rotates. Often this injury results in an isolated ACL tear. Non-contact ACL injuries are anywhere from 6 to 10 times more common in female athletes than in male athletes of the same sport. Some of the highest incidences occur in soccer and basketball athletes. Contact ACL injuries occur as a result of a valgus force. The femur internally rotates and the tibia externally rotates or the knee hyperextends during contact. This mechanism of injury often results in more than just an ACL injury. Typically, there are more structures that are damaged during the injury. Contact injuries are more common in female athletes than in male athletes as well. The signs and symptoms of ACL injuries include diffuse pain throughout the joint. No tenderness to palpation may be reported in isolated ACL injury cases at the time of injury. Rapid effusion or swelling within hours of the injury. Decreases in the range of motion for both flexion and extension of the knee. Decreased proprioception, a popping sensation, and patients may have episodes feeling like the knee is giving out or giving way when they're walking. The management of ACL injury should follow immediate immobilization. Although the patient may walk off the field, the ACL has been damaged and the knee is no longer stable. 
The more the knee moves around, the more damage could occur to the surrounding structures in the knee. Therefore, it is vital to place the patient on crutches so they are non-weight bearing. The patient will typically need surgery to correct the injured ligament and restore stability to the knee. Even with surgery, approximately 80% of repaired ACL injuries will result in osteoarthritis in the knee. If the injury is not repaired, it is likely that the patient will eventually need a total knee replacement. ACL sprain and the unhappy triad. The unhappy triad is also known as the terrible triad. This is a complete or partial tear of the anterior cruciate ligament, medial collateral ligament, and the medial meniscus all at the same time, resulting from one single knee injury. Unfortunately, these three structures are commonly combined in injury for contact sports, especially for female athletes. So if you suspect a contact ACL mechanism, we need to evaluate the medial meniscus and suspect medial collateral ligament involvement as well. Posterior cruciate ligament sprains, also known as a PCL strain. An injury to the posterior cruciate ligament requires a powerful force. A common cause of injury is a bent knee hitting a dashboard in a car accident or a football player falling on a knee that has been bent. Injuries to the posterior cruciate ligament are not as common as other knee ligament injuries. In fact, they are often subtle and more difficult to evaluate than other ligamentous injuries in the knee. Many times, a posterior cruciate ligament injury occurs along with other injuries to other structures in the knee, such as cartilage or other ligaments or bone. The typical symptoms of a posterior cruciate ligament injury are radiating pain posteriorly, pain with swelling that occurs steadily and quickly after the injury, swelling that makes the knee stiff and may cause a limp, difficulty walking, a popping sensation may be absent even though the tendon has been ruptured, and the knee will typically feel unstable, like it may give out at any time. Management for posterior cruciate ligament sprains is to split the individual in extension of the knee and refer to an orthopedic specialist. Although these injuries are rare, they typically require surgical intervention to address. Meniscal tears. A meniscus tear is usually caused by twisting or turning quickly, often with the foot planted while the knee is bent. Meniscus tears can occur when you lift something heavy or play sports. As you age, your meniscus gets worn and this can make it easier to tear. Signs and symptoms of meniscal tears include pain at the joint line, delayed effusion, limited range of motion, especially loss of full extension in the knee, clicking, snapping, or locking with movement, feeling like the knee is giving out, and what is called movie theater sign. Movie theater sign is pain in the knee after prolonged periods of sitting. Management for meniscal injuries includes immobilization and referral to an orthopedic specialist. If it is a small tear, the injury may be managed by treating the symptoms of the injury. If it is a more serious tear, the injury may be managed by surgery, including suturing the damaged meniscus. Unfortunately for the meniscus, there are portions of the meniscus that are what are called avascular, meaning there is no good blood flow to that part of the meniscus. If an avascular portion of the meniscus is damaged, the protocol might include removing either part or all of the damaged tissue in a procedure known as a meniscectomy. Meniscus tears are classified by their shape and location. Different types of meniscus injuries include a longitudinal or vertical tear, a transverse or radial tear, horizontal flap tear, a bucket handle tear, an oblique flap tear, and a displaced horizontal flap tear. Tibial plateau fractures. A tibial plateau fracture is a bone fracture or break in the continuity of the bone, 
occurring in the proximal part of the tibia or the shin bone, called the tibial plateau. This affects the knee joint, stability, and motion. The tibial plateau is a critical weight-bearing area located on the upper portion of the tibia and is composed of two slightly concave condyles, a medial condyle and a lateral condyle, that are separated by an intercondylar eminence and sloping areas in the front and behind it. Tibial plateau fractures may be divided into low-energy or high-energy fractures. Low energy fractures are commonly seen in older females due to osteoporotic bone changes and are typically depressed fractures. High energy fractures are commonly the result of motor vehicle accidents, falls, or sport-related injuries. High energy fractures constitute the majority of tibial plateau fractures in young individuals. Tibial plateau fractures typically present with knee effusion swelling of the knee soft tissue, and inability to bear weight. The, may <clears throat> the knee may even be deformed due to displacement and or fragmentation of the tibia, which leads to loss of its normal structural appearance. Blood in the soft tissues or knee joint, also known as hemarthrosis, may lead to bruising and a slightly doughy feel of the knee joint. Due to the tibial plateau's proximity to important vascular and neurological structures, injuries to these may occur upon fracture. A careful examination of the neurovascular systems is imperative. A serious complication of a tibial plateau fracture is what is called compartment syndrome, in which swelling causes compression of the nerves and blood vessels inside the leg and may ultimately lead to necrosis or cell death of the leg tissues. The management of a tibial plateau fracture should include splinting the person in the position that they were found and checking the distal pulse. A patella knee fracture. A patella fracture is a fracture of the kneecap, which is one of the most common knee injuries. It is usually the result of a hard blow to the front of the knee or landing from a fall on the patella. The incident of patella fractures in the NFL or National Football League is on the rise. Many players are taking the knee pads out of their uniforms. The league has seen a fairly significant spike in patella fractures. Without the knee pad, there is nothing to protect the superficial bony structure from helmets, shoulder pads, and the hard impact of the ground. Common signs and symptoms of a patella fracture include sharp, throbbing pain. Pain is typically increased with active knee extension. Crepitus or creaking may occur, and pre-patella bursa rupture is possible. Managing a patella fracture should include splinting the patient in the position that they were found and referral to an emergency department and or orthopedic specialist. Treatment options for patella fracture include non-surgical and surgical options, depending upon the type of fracture. An undisplaced fracture of the patella will take around four to six weeks of immobilization in a cylinder cast to heal, while a displaced fracture requires surgical treatment, followed by quadriceps strengthening exercises for complete rehabilitation. Bipartite patella is a congenital condition, meaning it was present at birth, that occurs when the patella is made up of two bones instead of one single bone. Normally, the two bones would fuse together as the child grows, but in bipartite patella, they remain as two separate bones. Individuals with a bipartite patella are often confused as having a fractured patella, and x-rays can help distinguish this condition. Tibiofemoral dislocation, also known as a knee dislocation. Knee dislocations are commonly accompanied by arterial or nerve injuries, which makes them very serious. Most anterior dislocations result from hyperextension. Most posterior dislocations result from a posteriorly directed force to a proximal tibia while the knee is slightly flexed. Knee dislocations commonly result from severe trauma, 
For example, a high-speed motor vehicle crash or a severe sports injury. But seemingly slight trauma, such as stepping in a hole and twisting the knee, can also sometimes dislocate the knee. A dislocation always damages structures that support the knee joint and cause knee joint instability. Joint instability due to extensive ligament injury is a common long-term complication of knee injury. Other structures that are commonly injured include the popliteal artery, particularly in anterior dislocations, perineal nerve, and tibial nerve. Undiagnosed arterial injury has a high risk of ischemic complications, which may lead to lower leg amputation. Dislocation will typically cause a deformity that is clinically obvious. However, some dislocations will spontaneously reduce before medical evaluation. In such cases, the knee will remain very swollen and grossly unstable. Fullness in the popliteal fossa or the back of the knee suggests a hematoma or popliteal artery injury. The management for a tibiofemoral dislocation or knee dislocation includes stabilizing the patient as movement is contraindicated meaning it is not advised. As other structures are involved, the potential for complication is great. Check the distal pulse and immediate referral to an emergency department is warranted. Patella dislocation or subluxation. Patella dislocation occurs when the patella or the kneecap slips out of its normal position in the patellofemoral groove and generally causes intense pain with swelling of the knee. The patella generally dislocates laterally and can be accompanied by acute pain and disability. Immediate reduction can be accomplished by extension of the knee and by providing a medial pressure to move the patella back into the patellofemoral groove. Extension of the knee on its own could also possibly move the patella back into place because this motion locks the knee in place. When the knee is locked, the ligaments are twisted and taut, allowing the muscles involved to relax and the patella will just slide back into place. If that does not work, a medical professional must manually perform an orthopedic reduction. Young athletes will suffer patella dislocations more commonly than any other age group. The average age of occurrence is 16 to 20 years of age. Sports commonly associated with injury involve sudden twisting motions of the knee and or impacts such as soccer, gymnastics, and ice hockey. This injury can also occur when a person trips over an object or slips on a slick surface, especially if that person has predisposing factors. People often describe the pain as being inside the kneecap. The leg tends to flex even when it's relaxed. In some cases, the injured ligaments involved in patella dislocation do not allow the leg to flex almost at all. Management should include knee extension to help reduce the dislocation, and we may need to refer for further evaluation if if the patella will not relocate on its own. Patella tendon rupture. The superior portion of the patella tendon attaches on the posterior portion of the patella, and the inferior portion of the patella tendon attaches to the tibial tubercle on the front of the tibia. Above the patella are the quadriceps muscle, large muscles on the front of the thigh. The quadriceps tendon attaches to the top of the patella. This structure allows the knee to flex and extend allowing use of basic functions such as walking and running. The telltale sign of a ruptured patella tendon is movement of the patella further up into the quadriceps area. When rupture occurs, the patella loses support from the tibia and moves towards the hip when the quadriceps muscle is contracted. Because of the lack of attachment, it hinders the leg's ability to fully extend the knee. This means that those affected cannot stand as their knee will typically buckle and give way when they attempt to do so. Patella tendon ruptures are common as a secondary injury after a chronic inflammation, such as patella tendonitis, of the tendon, 
which has previously created damage and degradation of the tendon structure and strength. Signs and symptoms of patella tendon rupture include severe pain, inability to extend the knee, and obvious deformity. Management should include splinting the knee in extension and referral to a physician. Patella tendon ruptures are rare in sports.